Hello listeners, welcome to Chatty AF, the anime feminist podcast, and our watch-along of Princess Tutu. This time around, we're doing episodes 7 through 13. My name is Vry, uh, I'm an editor and contributor at Anime Feminist. You can uh, find me on Twitter, at Writer Vry, and if you check my pinned thread, you can find all the neat places I freelance, or you can find the other podcast I co-host, at TrashPod. Uh, today, with me once again, I have Miranda and Chiaki, if you two ladies want to introduce yourselves. Yeah, of course. Hello, I'm Marina Sanchez. Uh, I work at IGN. I am a senior editor. Uh, I'm on our editorial team, so I help cover games, but I also kind of run our anime content, you know, pick and choose and say, hey, let's write about these good things. Uh, so I was very excited to come on and talk about Princess Tutu, because I've never seen it before. And hi, I'm uh, Chiaki Hirai. Uh, I am one of the editors at Anime Feminist. Um, aside from working for this website, I'm a beat reporter for a Japanese American newspaper in San Francisco. And you can find me tweeting out of Chiaki747. Um, it's a permanent locked account, but feel free to send me a request if you like. Awesome. All right, well, we are week two of four into our 2-2 two -two watch, which marks the end of the first half, or the chapter of the egg. How are you two getting along with this stretch of episodes? Right, you were right. I apologize. I told you. Have you met my son? <laughs> Have you met my very good son? Your son is beautiful. Oh. Wonderful. He's so good, but oh, I mean, it's hard to forgive him when he just, you know, smacks a guy, and you can't, it's like, hey, hey. I understand. He does. I get what after watching through two thirteen, like you get why he's so aggressive towards Muto, but it's just like simmer down a little, just a little. But again, he did try to almost kill himself, or Muto almost tried to kill himself, like saving an animal. And so it's like I understand why you're like the firm love, but ooh, yes. yeah. I he he did some bad shit. It does. I think at least for me, what ameliorates it a lot is that his dad also says, what the fuck are you doing? That's mm -hmm. true. <laughs> for me, when a character does shit things, having the other characters turn around and go, what the fuck <laughs> in narrative goes a long way for me. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think everyone, well, it's interesting, like looking, so if we're just going to talk about Vakir for a second, it's weird seeing his trajectory of just like admiring and caring for Muto to obsessively making sure that Muto's not hurting himself in the, like, benefit of others. <laughs> and, like, how that's kind of pushed him a little far a lot. I think that just became his normal. This tiny child control freak, I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yes. Right, you're right, and I love him very much. Yay! <laughs> you're validated. I do. I feel so validated. These are these are all my children, and I love them and must protect them. <laughs> <laughs> I um I did notice while you were because uh, Chiaki has been live tweeting her viewing experience, which is great for me. Um, I apparently discovered new things about the fact that the available stream for this show kind of sucks. Oh yeah, yeah. You're talking about the fact that um, Fakir starts speaking in German speaking the deutsch oh <laughs> yes i am and then uh there's yeah, no yes, subs for it <laughs> except for uh unless I... you can speak japanese or read japanese i was just like <laughs> is this can can figure do magic is that just what's happening here and then it's never touched upon again i guess <laughs> okay <laughs> no, sure he's speaking the deutsch <laughs> yeah that was off deutsch a thing that happened <laughs> It makes me very sad, because I had assumed that uh, they were just, that the version on High Dive was like a rip of the home release uh, of the dub, but no, it seems to be just like the Japanese television uh, video and the English dub audio without any of the subtitling that was put onto the home release, which sucks. It sucks. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh. Um, also, if you are watching High Dive's app on, like, a console, so I've been watching on my Xbox, um, it has these awful bright white bars instead of black bars. Oh, God. It's, just, it's very annoying when it's late, and you're just like, well, okay. <laughs> Here we like, are. <laughs> it's better than nothing, I guess, but oof. Yeah, it's, it's very weird. High Dive's have some stuff to figure out, but... 
that's not Tutu's fault. <laughs> no, no, Tutu is a good show. Yeah, no, I was tempted to just find somebody with the DVDs and just be like, can I borrow them, please? Let's just, can I? <laughs> I mean, n- especially now that the, uh, the remaster is out, I think that um, every time Sentai has a sale, Tutu always goes on sale for like six bucks. Oh my so gosh. like, if the next one comes around, you can get it really cheap. Although I will caution you, um, the version I have right now, I discovered that I got as like a cheap bargain set. They just stacked all the discs on top of each other. They're they're not individually uh, racked. Oh. It's just a stack of DVDs. It they sucks. do that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've actually ever seen that. That's not good. <laughs> No, it's not. It's it's like the most cheapo cheap option, which makes me sad that I consolidated and got rid of our other slightly older one. Whoops. Oh, well. Well, I am very excited to pick it up whenever that happens. Because I want to see Miss Adel again. I already miss her. She's, she's, so, she's good. so good. She's like, it's, it's such a blatant heartstring tug. But also, it gives me sadness. I realize we're also like just kind of jumping around crazy here because I just I think coming off of episode 13 you just have a lot of feelings it's like oh a lot happened it's okay I I, I encourage you to to explore Uh, but I think that is as good as a place as any to start because it's something that has been it's one of those things that has been aesthetically present for the entire series so far but it has become in sharper and sharper thematic relief Uh, the the clockwork imagery and the the added to the explicit puppetry imagery with Drosselmeyer. Yes, mm-hmm. I love all of that so much because you see in every character and the characters that don't have that sort of grip Drosselmeyer just freaks out about, um, specifically with Krahe, which I was kind of surprised by because we're like, oh yeah, like the raven, obviously it's evil. Um, the raven is Krahe to some extent, which is also still a little bit weird because we don't, it's like weird to say that we don't really know what that means completely because there's implications that Krahe isn't necessarily bad. And I don't understand why. But I understand that's being implied through like the whole um, story with the shoes and like that's how she transforms. And that sort of seems like a little bit of an unwillingness there. I'm not too mm-hmm. sure why. It's like, huh, hmm. interesting. Um, and there is that one point where Drosselmeyer fig- figures, or I guess, no, he freaks out at the end of one of the episodes. And he's saying, like, because like, uh, she she addresses him directly. So yeah, that was at the beginning of one of the episodes. But at the end of I think a episode before, it's like you have to know your place, you have to fit in, kind of thing. You have to fit in this puzzle or this this whole story, or like you're dangerous, you don't belong. Mm-hmm. And it's like so interesting to see how she's the outlier when she seems like she has a very obvious role. Yeah, it's um that that line is a recurrent one. The it, it's a it's a dangerous thing. To not, not to know your place in the world. Yeah. Which is an extremely loaded sentiment. Especially for something like shoujo, which is uh, so much a coming of age type genre. Like those are the predominant stories that it tells. And especially for an anime in Japan, which is very much about, you know, fulfilling expected roles and, and growing up and and embracing what's expected of you. Is growing up really like, you know, but I feel like that's kind of how parenting works, right? Like you're you're told from your teachers, your parents that you got to, you know, grow up to be an upstanding member of society or whatever, you know, and there's these prescribed understandings of how that works, and I feel like Tutu kind of tried to circumvent that, like, no, you can kind of grow up and not be exactly what people expected yeah yeah very much like there's there's this exerted pressure from drosselmeyer the uh puppet master which by the way i I forgot to mention it last time um part of the reason the nutcracker music is so prominent in this series is that uh drosselmeyer is the name of clara's aunt in or uncle in in the nutcracker he's the one who gives her the doll so very deliberate pull there but yeah there's the series has this very existent tension between the author and the characters who refuse to do what he wants them to do which is multi you know very multi-layered like you said chiaki it's it's as much about these these tiny infant children trying to find their own way to grow up and still be good 
because they're so good. Yeah. I love them. Yeah. The town itself is also really interesting um, because this is supposed to be outside the story, but it still feels like it inside the story at the same time like they keep going back to that clock and that clock very obviously shows all of their roles like it shows the knight it shows the princess and the prince and it shows what is kind of like the raven or it looks like a swan sometimes um and so it's just kind of weird to see how this all plays out even though they're supposed to be outside the story but it still feels like they're inside one still being controlled or is it because i feel like it, it, being framed within the show it, there's kind of sort of this meta humor that it is part of the story. The city is part of the story. Mm. Right, which goes into, you know, every, whenever, you know, when Tutu goes someplace, the the frame becomes a stage. And that's why mime is so important and why you dance out your feelings. But a lot of times as, as this part of the show goes on, People dance out their feelings, and the sh the framing is very stage-like often, even when magic is not explicitly happening. Like, there is a strong sense of performance, whether it's actual ballet performance or characters performing who they think they are supposed to be at a given moment. Right. I think this kind of brings me back to Vakir's very specific episode. I think it was episode 10. Um, when you kind of find find out how he met Muto. And it's weird because Muto seems like he's still the same from that time. Like he actually hasn't aged. Mm. Um, and so, but also at the same time, like Fakir's father like knew who Muto was, like as the prince, like this is a whole legend. And this town's kind of knows about all these legends. And so like kind of seeing how all of that plays in together with the story is very interesting. And like mm. you were saying about the stages, and of course, um, in the last episode, we talked about how um, the traveling performers came in and like their manager turned into a Neil. And it's like, oh, he's always been like that. And so this unique place, even when magic things aren't happening, there's still magic happening. Yeah, that is a good point about Muto, though. Um, he does, you know, Fakir gets older, uh, all the char other characters get older, but he's the same. And in some ways, it's almost as though he is this kind of cipher, almost, where you have our three other, you know, human characters, even if they are also playing story roles, who all see and want something very different when they look at him. That's true. I think it's also strange. I guess looking at all the other characters, too, I noticed they all have transformations where, like, Muto is just Muto. Like, he's the prince. Everyone knows that. Like, he just stays in that role. And everyone else has some sort of... I mean, even, like, Fakir. Like, Fakir is still him, but he's also eventually the knight. Like, we understand that he's the knight. And that wasn't just something... I mean, he always was, but at the same time, um, that's something he has to perform. Yeah, it... Um... Goddamn, Fakir has such a problem he, with this l large boulder of toxic masculinity on his back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it's almost as though Muto represents something different to each person. Like, uh, he is all things to all people, and in the same way hasn't, and like, which is part and parcel of him having no intrinsic identity. You know, for, for Fakir, he is sort of a, both kind of a masculine ideal who is strong and unafraid and also protects the weak but also is conveniently you know sort of there's there's no there there and he like drives himself into being a terrible person trying to to live up to protect what he thinks that is even if it's not a real person and then you know rue and duck are both seeing very different things that they think Muto is supposed to represent in what they should be doing with their lives. On that note, I kind of had, I no, I jotted this down in my notes, but um, I felt like Muto was a bit like um, he's a puppet as much as like Adel or anyone else in the story is. Oh mm. yeah, like, I totally agree with that. And I feel like at the very end, he finally kind of gain some personal gumption, I guess is a word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, uh, I mean, it's certainly no coincidence that they save love 
for the very end of the first half of the show, although they don't specify what kind of love it is, which is kind of a recurring element throughout the show that I find interesting, even if I wish, even if it's not nearly as gay as I wish they would make it. It's still pretty gay. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of undeniable things going on here. Just we know there's passion. We know. <laughs> lots and lots of passion. These are all these are all children and I love them and I support them. And also they all have dumb 12 year old crushes on each other. <laughs> Absolutely. It's very good. One thing that I actually didn't notice until this go around that um, that tickled me very much is that um, the episode, each, each episode is tied to a piece of music and the episode, I think it's seven or eight, uh, is the prologue or the, uh, the, um, the first, why is that word escaping me now? Not the, uh, the gosh darn, the overture, there we go. The overture to the Romeo and Juliet ballet, which, um, is also the episode where Fakir and Duck uh, really start interacting in earnest, which tickles me in my heart place. <laughs> oh my goodness. Them too. They are... Okay. Okay. <laughs> I have to parse through this because I have a lot of feelings about them, and they're good Please feelings, do. and they're both confused because I I love them as a pair. They're so good and weird and... I, I love that Fakir was the first one that Duck got to reveal, like, her true self to. Because Miss Adel early on says, like, hey, maybe you need an ally. And, like, her ally goes first to Muto. She's like, oh, I need, a, I need to tell him. Like, we need to protect him from Fakir because Fakir doesn't want to restore his heart. Um, and she never really finds that ally. Like, at least not in that episode. She doesn't figure it out quickly. And then we see her and Fakir start getting closer and, like, kind of uniting in, you know, actually doing what's best for Muto on, on, or at least what they think is best for him and, like, following his requests. And it's just so good because their dynamic's so weird because Fakir's just so serious. And Duck's just Duck. She's just tripping everywhere. And uh, it's so good. It's so, so good. I'm not normally a fan of of awkward nudity gags, but that one's really funny. <laughs> he grabs her underwear and he's just so surprised. It's so good. I, that's the thing that we were talking about it last time and their, their awkward nudity gags are just very good and funny and pure and they're not ill-intentioned and that's why they can be so funny. Mm-hmm. It's, it's very sweet. It's, it's very good. And I, I enjoy the way that they they help each other out like like Fakir has sort of the some of the conviction at the moment that Duck lacks it but also his in her influence on him is very important because he you know at just at he spends so much of this stretch of episodes having to be extremely macho and have to do everything himself and at the big climactic moment during the during swan lake he he steps aside and and tells her to do it because because feelings because feelings are important (laughs) yeah i always i kind of wonder why duck doesn't use her princess tutu powers that much because like at the very beginning we see that she has abilities but whenever she gets captured by crahi or even in swan lake it doesn't seem like she really wants to like fight and that's fine it's just interesting that they show this early on it's like she has capabilities to do things but they're not necessarily aggressive i guess mm. yeah like she she has her magic vines but they really only get used to to reach like to to form bridges or bonds or or catch up to people like they are tools of communication even mm. if they could be weapons that's a good way to put it because like she was trapped in that cage it's like you could just use the maybe the vine just break the cage help out but i guess then fakir needs to come in on his horse so yeah she's also (laughs) bound by the rules of dramatic tension yeah that's kind of what i feel like a lot of it is it's like tutu you could have you could have gone and gone first here at swan lake but uh it's fine fakir has to do his thing i get it hey i mean you know (laughs) they they already got the horse what are they gonna what else are they gonna do with it 
<laughs> Where is he getting this horse? Why is this horse <laughs> just around whenever it needs? <laughs> good question it's very good it's the horse of dramatic timing <laughs> and i love it so much is there like a greek word for that kind of like do sex machina but do sex horse <laughs> horse sex <laughs> <laughs> yes good uh we haven't really talked about we've sort of hit on everybody in a roundabout way except for poor rue who has a hard time this stretch of episodes. Poor Rue. Yeah. yeah. She needs a hug. Yes. She needs a hug. So, I was talking a little bit about it earlier, about her maybe not willingly being bad, and mm -hmm. I always come back to her music because it, it's just so soft and sad and it, it doesn't ever feel super malevolent. Or uh, her theme, I forget which, which song it's called. It's like Nocturne something something something. Mm. Very beautiful piano piece. It's put on a lot of lullaby CDs. I know this because I was listening to it earlier, and I was just like, why is this all on baby lullaby CDs? She can't be huh. evil. <laughs> so, oh. She's just in love. and is. But her love is so weird because she's so okay with Muto just being a puppet, and that that's always just weird, you know? I, I, I just felt like her appreciation of Muto was a little bit more benign, like, oh, I'm gonna pull with him whatever, with whatever he happens to be doing, you know? It even seemed like she was kind of happy that he was regaining some of his emotions or feelings at the very beginning, like, mm -hmm. during the first six episodes. Yeah, and then, then she gets scared because she thinks, oh, oh no, uh, what if I'm not good enough and he doesn't love me anymore? Mm -hmm. Oh, no. <laughs> Right. I, I've Rue's whole ish like her fears in this honestly kind of remind me of of Shinji Shinji's issue with girls in Evangelion a little bit where it's dramatizing this concept where at that age you want to be in love and to love someone but it's more about the experience of you being loved and you haven't yet thought through the experience of like you know, how much effort it takes to love someone back and what it means to support someone and understand that that other person has feelings and thoughts of their own separate from you. Whereas, like, she, I like, it's not that her feelings are fake. It's just that she is more afraid of being alone than she is of having someone not really mean it when they just, as long as they're saying the words. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um... Oddly enough, the one person who has a sort of practical perspective you're talking about is Mr. Cat. <laughs> the most unexpected turn of all. It's like, ex <laughs> excuse me? But, like, when he's talking to uh, Miss Gotet in episode 12, like, they're at that restaurant, right? And, he, and she's been, like, pursuing him. And you have uh, first Crahey um, when she's rude, walks by and, like, hearing him is like, hey, this is why we can't work out. Like, all this stuff and then eventually um fakir walks by and he's talking about change and like how that's important and you have to understand differences and like your conviction of will and all this stuff and it's just really <laughs> funny to hear him talk about this for all this time he's just been threatening us all his students to like marry him mm -hmm. it's it's so weird <laughs> yeah yeah and, and later on he he corners muto for classes on love and you hear a small snippet of it and he's teaching the importance of consent yeah like, this took a turn like what also it's just it's still strange to me sorry if you guys can hear the sirens um eh. city stuff yeah. uh anyway <laughs> it's just so weird to hear or no necessarily to see mr cat be so important it's mm -hmm. like why it's mr cat because <laughs> right, he's a comedy joke character yeah oh my goodness yeah it, it is i don't know it's one of those things where like on a basic literal level, this is weird and creepy, but it's also just there's so little actual intent behind it. I can't get super mad. Right, mm -hmm. and it's not like targeted, it's not specific, it's just literally everyone a general blanket threat because he's so mm -hmm. sad and then has to go groom himself and roll around and it's <laughs> and he's a cat. <laughs> he's a cat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's that's about it. I just love cats. Very good. 
cats are good. And he 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 rolls into he jumps into the window because because there's a thing there and you don't have to do that, silly cat, silly kitten. I watched that scene twice because I thought it was really good. <laughs> I thought, oh, it's gonna, he, he has to be in the practice room, but it's like Mr. Cat being super elegant. <laughs> what the heck? Which makes sense, because he's a cat. Mm-hmm. And I mean, he teaches there. I mean, he's obviously a dancer. Mm hmm. Right? Yes. Exactly. I, I do love, I love how, like, the, there's fewer scenes in the dance cl- in the dance room during this stretch of episodes because plot is happen. Um, but I love the kind of low-key ongoing thing of who we see dance is who we understand at the moment. Like, you know, you kind of, we see Rue a lot with the advanced class early on and then, but she kind of disappears from, from those moments with, uh, where, where Duck and the audience can see her once she becomes, you know, the the nominal antagonist. Uh, but we get to see Fakir instead as Duck begins to understand him more. He finally gets a scene um, as, a, as a dancer, not in combat. Yeah, it was so good to see him dance. Because we hadn't, I don't know if we actually had before this stretch of episodes. So he was just like in the class and being generally moody. <laughs> just sort of sulking places also i guess we didn't really talk about i know we've talked about fakir so much but i think that's totally fine <laughs> i just love um, my son that's all i love his episodes with duck when she's a duck like, yes they're just so sweet yes <laughs> it's good <laughs> it's very good oh so um i i my my wife was kind of rewatching these with me on and off and and you know she pointed out that this is it's a really good use of narrative indicator because fakir is being kind to someone even though there is no purpose to it like he's a very he's shown as a very manipulative and calculating character who does everything for a cause but then he's just he's just nice he's just nice even though there's nothing in it for him it's weird to say it's like the real fakir shows and he's alone <laughs> Like, when he doesn't have to be turned on and, like, protect the prince sort of deal. It's like he could just mm-hmm. coast and be a person. When a boy gives you that bread. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It was so sweet. Mm-hmm. The fact that she's so sad, but she's still got to eat that bread. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Like mood, kiddo. <laughs> I also just love their scene at the... I guess it's like a little pond, and it's outside, and like Fakir's crying. I'm like, you know, they just they just cuddle a little bit. It's really sweet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He just hugs it's the so duck. Nice. Yeah, and and it's definitely part of those things. Like, those are those are soft girl emotions, but but Duck gets to see them because he he do not realize that that she is our our humble protagonist, <laughs> and. You know, after having kind of that that moment of oh god, the humiliation. I think, I think it is a relief to him, for somebody to know that he is a soft and gentle child. <laughs> yeah, I think you you see that come through a lot too because he's obviously getting more comfortable with her, and thank goodness he's not actually dead, so that they could continue being comfortable. Hopefully, you know the story <laughs> does c- go on. <laughs> Although it. It's good he didn't drown, I guess, because he was under that water for a long time. I was really confused when they just turned around and left. I was like, what? Fakir was there? Where are you guys going? <laughs> oh, okay, no, 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 it's fine. He's gone now. It's fine. He went off stage. <laughs> so exactly. it was taken care of. It happened off stage. Um, mm, you mentioned last episode when we were kind of talking about things uh the idea that tutu seems like a different person from duck and that that kind of gets addressed through this span of episodes i actually wanted to bring that up um oh by all means. yeah no like i was noticing maybe this is kind of different from what you were thinking but i felt like duck like tutu i still feel tutu was like a different person from duck but at the same time mm-hmm. Like, at the very end here, like, Tutu became Duck, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Get what I mean? Yeah, yeah, because she has that moment where she accepts that these are her feelings that are giving her this yeah. power. 
Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, I was a little weirded out when I noticed that when Duck becomes 2-2, uh, her freckles go away. And it's like the weirdest little detail, but I was like, wow, that's, that's interesting. Maybe it's makeup. Anyway, to- <laughs> totally random aside. Um, yeah, she's born with it. Yeah. <laughs> she also gets more prominent cleavage as 2-2, which will never not re- weird me out. These are children. Yeah, yeah. It, a lot of things here when you transform to 2-2. Um, yeah, that happens sometimes. But, but, sometimes. <laughs> Man, I wish... Anyway, never mind. Uh, <laughs> Chiaki, I really do like your observation that her, like, Tutu is, like, recognizing Duck in a weird way because, like, it's never really had to go, I guess, like, that way. Mm-hmm. And before, like, it's just Duck always evolves to Tutu. And then she never has to address herself as Duck when she's Tutu. Um, and her having that moment to just kind of process and go through it and recognize that they're still the same person, though there, I think, are different goals there different powers, of course, different abilities, um, is really important and good. Mm. I do, uh, I was, uh, watching some of the special features for this, and I think some of them are online, um, the, the outtakes for this show are uh, pretty good, uh, but there was kind of an interesting detail when they did a little featurette with Lucy Christian, who plays Duck, that, uh, they actually, they were doing her Duck lines and her Tutu lines in different sessions, which is interesting to me. Huh. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, although, uh, you know, epi- this run of episodes starts with, uh, with the rejection of the call, to use the really pretentious term, this is a pretentious show on that way. I'm fine with it. Um, where, where she decides she doesn't want to be Tutu anymore. And I found it really interesting in the Japanese performance, at least, that it feels like at the end of that episode, she kind of merges that vocal performance where she sort of brings the rougher quality mm. uh, of Duck's voice in into when she's trying to get Muto's attention. And it's like this moment of that begins where I think she ends up with at the end of 13, um, beginning to realize that this is a performance put on, but, but, you know, she has to, when she willingly accepts that this is something she has to do and wants to do that she begins to take agency over it. Oh, that's such a good point. I don't, I don't remember if I actually, I think I was just so excited by the episode and like what was <laughs> happening that I didn't really notice that change in her voice as much. I, this is like my fourth time through the show. I have a lot of time to sit back and notice weird tiny details. So like, it's totally not like the first time through it's all feelings all the time. Everything is emotions and it's good. Yeah. David Cage wishes he could make princess Tutu. <laughs> please, please don't make that happen. <laughs> God, David, no. if you're listening, please don't do this. <laughs> David Cage, if you're listening, please go home and don't make games anymore. No, you can continue to make games. I still enjoy your games. They're awful, but I enjoy them. <laughs> Fair enough. Press F to emancipate. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, you mentioned it. Uh, we uh, mentioned it, but we haven't really gone into the the opening monologues which have gotten quite different since the first set of episodes when they were mostly just potted retellings of very famous fa- fairy tales and or ballets. Uh, those have changed. Oh, yes. <laughs> I find it interesting that we keep seeing the sword in like almost every opening monologue now. And mm-hmm. well, that sword is now broken. So I'm really curious about the implications of what that means. Um, Cause mm-hmm. obviously like, we ended with Swan Lake um, there are swans on the sword. Is Muto a swan? Mm. <laughs> Is he going to turn into a swan when he gets into Just a text? large bird. I know we're talking, like, I'm getting so... Yeah, but I think that's... Maybe that's what happens. Maybe he's just sad because he's not a duck any, Or, I guess, a swan anymore. <laughs> he does sad. have very feathery hair. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I know I'm going on a tangent here, but this is that was part of my thinking when I just kept seeing the sword being brought up. It's like, hmm. I mean, my favorite part of these is 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 newbies making wild guesses as to what everything means. So I encourage. It. I mean, as far as swans go, like you have Tutu and Crahi, which mm-hmm. I feel is a little weird or ironic. Maybe I don't I don't know if that's the word for it, but like you know, 
Tutu mm-hmm. is a duck. Uh, what if Cray he's a raven? The two, it's like what if they're the two mm. swans? Yeah. What if they're the swans on the sword, and he's <laughs> getting between them? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm a big fan of how much Duck loves Zuru, and I'm very sad that Kriki's like, I'm not Zuru. I'm like, no, but you still are. Be nice to each other. Anyway, sorry, another yeah. tangent, but I just no, thought no, of that I... right now. It's like, oh, they're like the actually shown to be birds. Like, Chiaki brought it up. And, and I've always been thinking of Kriki more as Raven. Yeah, but I feel like it, in at least Balego is Balego's like it's more about swans, right? Like that's kind of what you kind of tune into immediately. So I kind of see her more as a swan than a raven. Right. Mm. I actually did want to look up and see if there were ballets specifically with raven antagonists and I was like, "No, I probably should do that like after the fact. <laughs> just to, just in case, like we don't know." Um Yeah, none leap immediately to mind, but although between this and uh, last season's My Roommate is a Cat, anime doesn't like crows. Anime oh, doesn't yeah. like crows at all. Aww. At least Sad. Sailor Moon likes crows. And didn't Lane have it's good true. crows? Uh, uh, maybe. Mm. Uh, uh. It's been so long. So I was just trying to put in a good word for the crows. <laughs> <laughs> I do love that, or it makes me very sad that... I, some a lot of the stuff with Rue feels like a moment where the show is specifically commenting on shoujo tropes because it's so common to have you know the 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 plucky natural beauty sort of of protagonist and then her rival you know the sort of the 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 sort of mean bitchy popular girl who is evil and selfish and doesn't really love the 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 uh, love interest or doesn't deserve his love because she's fake and shallow and scheming and Rue is playing that role but she doesn't really want to and Duck doesn't want her to either but she feels like she has to and so does the male author who's making them fight yeah, isn't that like all male friends. authors <laughs> um, hashtag not all male authors I'm sorry um, yeah <laughs> Uh, no, no, but yes. It just, it's so, because they, they do care about each other. I think, I think Rue and like Fakir is a little bit Sundere, but, but she cares about Duck a lot in her heart place and it's very good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm really curious to see where it goes from here though. Cause I mean, Rue just gets, I guess, Craig, he just gets to leave. Like the battle has been won. Uh, Muto and Tutu go dance. It's very sweet. But like, where does that leave Craigie? Like, she just is she just done? I mean, I'm I'm really curious to see where it goes. I know I'm kind of just veering off mm-hmm. again, but, um, yeah, but like, yeah, there are uh, a lot of unanswered things. Yeah, because I don't know. Because like at this point, I feel like the story is done. But then it's like, no, we don't have all the heart shards. Like the prince is incomplete. So what does that mean? And how does like I can't, part of me really hopes Rue does come back and like she kind of pushes off Krahi as this was maybe part of my identity or maybe it's part of me but it's not who I want to be I don't know I, that's what I'm hoping for because I, I do really like her and I want her and Tutu to be fr- or I guess Duck to be friends I like that too they're good girls does that happen <laughs> they're good children does that happen Bri I uh can neither confirm nor deny any future plot details <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, but an arbiter here to guide you through this uh, magical experience. All right. And literally every every person I can talk to who hasn't watched the show yet, because it is uh, one of the greatest anime ever made. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I definitely need to get my twin sister to watch this because she's gonna love the heck out of it. So yeah, it's such a good show for kids. Like yeah, it, it's why I'm glad that it, like. You know, it's it's been nice watching the sub this time around, but I am glad that the show has such a good dub, especially for, like, the early to mid-2000s. It makes it really good to just show to, you know, younger kids who maybe aren't super comfortable with, with subtitles yet or, or can't read as well for big words like pas de deux. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't want to read that. I mean, I don't even I understand. <laughs> I don't even want to say it. 
<laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> I was just like, oh, she's dancing. Or uh, Tutu is dancing that one dance alone. That's a thing. <laughs> Pot of dews are hard. I never, I never got to do one when I, uh, when I was doing dance. They seem very romantic. Yeah. But you have to be able to, to toe shoe. So here we are. So we didn't even uh, talk about her dance. But her dance at the end, the end of episode thirteen is just so good. The emotion. It it's absolutely beautiful. I, I feel like the animators really poured a lot of extra love into that, and. You know, the designs are very simplified. They have almost sort of a, a Princess Knight kind of look is what they remind me of. That that, that very early, like, 70s shoujo. Uh, but they're so talented at showing how much strain her body is under do- dancing this with, with these tiny little details. And I, I love that sequence. Thank you for bringing it up. Oh, gosh, yeah. And I, I wrote down um, how... I love how they frame all of that as well. Like, we, we know that this is the stage, this is the final stage for the final battle kind of thing. And we've had many different kinds of stages, but this one they just paid very good attention to angles and putting drama and really made you feel like you're watching something special. And, of course, like, the dance is such a big part of that too. And I think they just they just killed it in this episode. It's so good. It's good. It gives me feelings. Yeah, I I love the the way that the because you know dance dance is about the bo- actors' bodies and their motions, but it's also about their their emotions. And the camera has a lot of power over that here. Where where when Rue is dancing in the final battle, it it's very much at a distance from her. There's a lot of mid shots, whereas we get a lot of those close-ups that that take us into you know the fact that that tutu is trembling her her you know her her ankles are popping tendons because it's so hard to hold in that position and like we we feel her her struggle and how much this means to her but we're kept at a distance from from crahey because you know she's she's fading as this is happening as it were and it's it's very well directed Mm -hmm. It was Whenever. very touching. Feelings. It was very touching to watch mm-hmm. all that. I'll definitely mm-hmm. say. Mm-hmm. I especially liked when a uh, zombie Mewtwo got up and joined Tutu. It was like, oh, he did. He he made a conscious action, even without even without the the love shard. He did it. I know you guys were mentioning this earlier too, but it's so nice to see Mewtwo like have a personality. <laughs> <laughs> like take form because before like the last six episodes it's like why does anybody like this guy aside from him being like maybe just like generally attractive and a good dancer like he doesn't mm-hmm. offer anything as a person mm-hmm. it's like how i mean i guess when you're that young like it's a little different like your priorities are kind of like your crushes are kind of different mm-hmm. um but it's good to see him have a will yeah. yeah i think especially when you're that young and you're crushing on somebody it's 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 less about who that person is than who you think that they are and and part of growing up is is beginning to recognize another you know another person's individual humanity it's all metaphorized and such which you know uh duck is beginning to understand here but rue hasn't gotten there yet because she feels so rejected and like fair enough like you know part of part of me in my brain is like oh pretty people have problems too but it's genuinely hurtful how every time every time she goes and does something you know she's she's told that that crows are are ugly and vicious and nobody wants them and that she should die basically that's horrible they're like 12 yeah (laughs) these are children are they really supposed to be like 12 i mean they're they're probably twelve to fourteen. Yeah, yeah, they they definitely look like it. It's just so it's so weird. It's like Drosselmeyer, how dare you? They're babies. <laughs> how dare you? Like he's to these infants. Yeah, I feel like he's the real villain in all this. Like just being a sadist, just mm-hmm. putting them all through this. Like just ringing them through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he's so very disinterested in how everyone feels. He's he's utterly caught up in the mechanics of how the story works, which, if you know, if anything, all that clockwork. If anything, he's um, ecstatic that they're suffering. Mm-hmm. Just like Lily. more, 
more so than the uh, <laughs> first six episodes. I, I just I really started feeling, it. man, this guy's kind of an asshole. <laughs> uh huh. Russell, kind of an asshole. That uh, that begins to touch upon it. I think you even see that with um, Miss Adel and like how uncaring he is for her. It's like you are just a puppet. You are not allowed to have feelings when you start growing affection for something. Like you're becoming useless essentially. It's like ah. Oh. How cruel! Miss Adel tries so hard. Mm-hmm. She's good. And she's, she's kind of the first to embody the the one of her first lines, which I will go ahead and tell you, will go will continue to be important. Uh, that that line of, you know, to those who accept their fate, happiness; to those who defy it, their fate, glory. Mm-hmm. Which, oh, you know, she dies, yes. yeah. but but she goes out in a literal place of glory. <laughs> Yeah, doing something for the people she cared about, which mm-hmm, is, mm-hmm. it's it's cool because it's like that was of her own will. Like she, she had to break what she was supposed to do her role in order to do something she cared to do, and I love it. I love it, and I want all of them to defy the roles and just give the figure to Drosselmeyer and, and live a happy life. <laughs> Well, you there's another 13 episodes to go, so, you know, steal yourself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's old. He can't I dance am... as hard, right? <laughs> In a dance battle, he's got to lose, right? This is true. Yes. He's made them powerful dancers. <laughs> it will be his downfall. <laughs> <laughs> I am kind of curious as to where you two think the series is going from here because like you said it it does kind of close one particular chapter and you know in in some ways it does stop but there's a lot of it's also a a whole open world of things it could do well obviously they're going to bring Rue back right hmm well she is in the opening of the show like she's one of the main <laughs> characters so i figure they're going to try to get her back from being like evil maybe mhm 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 hmm. yes good hmm. it's it's hard i would i'd like to agree with chiaki here and say yes they will try to save her from being sad because she was just rejected and lost a dance battle, and that probably hurts her pride a whole lot. Because <laughs> she is a great losing a dance battle is no small matter. <laughs> it's very serious. Yeah, I, want to do um... I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean. What is Muto if not learning that there is more to life than being very, very ridiculously good looking? <laughs> I did not expect us to go with these two parallels, but I am, I am super into it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so went over Rue, um, but they have to get the rest of the heart shards, and we don't know what that means. Um, I don't think the heart shards are being prioritized based on the strength of emotions, which is kind of weird to say, um, because we already have fear, we have love, and those are, those are pretty powerful things, Mm. so, um, I'm... It's kind of hard to know what they do from there. I, I don't imagine that they can keep doing the same thing because it's like a known quantity, like we kind of overcome it. So it's like, what's the next way for Tutu to go get the heart shards? And will the Muto have a more active role in it too now that he has more of his heart back? Like, what, what can he do? Can he do things? Mm. What about a sword? It's broken. <laughs> he has no sword. Yeah. What do? <laughs> I guess he just, uh, cheerleader, yeah. That works. The important role of the supportive shoujo boyfriend, which is better <laughs> than the uh, dickweed shoujo boyfriend, which we see too often. Yes. I mean, he's a good seems backup good. dancer, right? Seems good, seems good. Has hands in the back. Yes, I like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, as far as, like, what danger or what opponent there could be, it's really hard to say because if if Craigie was the crow then that's kind of it as far as all of Drosselmeyer wrote and then we kind of end up with the problem of like this is unfinished story like what happens next so mm. I feel like they haven't really left us with a lot of clues as to what actually happens next yeah uh, something that 
is just a little thing, but that I like a lot is that uh, the opening theme, the, the music for the opening theme doesn't end. It just kind of trails off. Like a, a lot of openings will have that, you know, firm final note and, and a nice conclusive ending. But the the opening for Tutu just kind of fades out right on into the show. Which, given oh. that, uh, you know, a story that never ends is a sad thing. Does this end on a cliffhanger? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> I haven't said anything. I mean, but the <laughs> thing is, not. like music does that there, there used to be like i used to play jazz a lot and there there were a lot of mm -hmm. tunes that just end like oh yeah just keep playing the last three bars over and over until you get too quiet for the audience to hear oh it absolutely does and with that particular piece of music that they're lifting from it's because it would go into another movement that's a lot more you know dramatic and sturm und drang but i think it is an interesting choice given the themes of the show like it feels like you you could have had a you you could have had what a more you know like one of those show show themes that ends with a shot of the full cast instead of it's just it, but instead we have that music that kind of fades out and tutu leaping off into the darkness which i think is such a neat final shot mm. yeah speaking of That's tutu true. i just was looking over some of my last notes um in episode 12 i believe rue when she reveals she's crazy she she's talking about how it's tragic that Princess Tutu only gets a few sentences in the book, like or in the story, mm. and that's it. Like she's just destined to become a speck of light, and that's it. Like she doesn't do much. Um, and I think maybe the intro is like an interesting parallel there because her character is kind of unwritten in a way. Like she has a mm. lot of opportunity to kind of do things as long as she does not meet that one fate. Mm. And so where everyone has like these very set roles. It's like, you're going to sacrifice yourself. You're the villain and you will fight the prince. Tutu is, I don't know. She's supposed to tell the prince that she loves him and just fade away. <laughs> so it's really interesting to see how maybe that'll play into the next season too, or next season, uh, next half. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead in, in that way, because, because this is such a nothing character. There is infinite room to expand. Yeah. Mm, pretentious theater references. Mm. Pat myself on the back. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> Was there anything you uh, you two wanted to touch on that we didn't get to? Uh, I'm good. Mm. I'm mm. I'm really enjoying all the animal students. That that was a note I had. Yes. Oh. <laughs> the the Mexican accent for the child <sighs> was a choice. <laughs> what the fuck, Dub? I saw those like. Oh, all right. Someone watched too many Taco Bell commercials at the time. I see. Decisions were made, and they were bad. Back in yeah. 2000. <laughs> Womp. Ugh. Yeah. Um, I think, who was it? Was it Miss Crocodilia or somebody? When she smelled like a yummy duck when Duck was still stuck as a duck. It's pretty good. <laughs> it's good. I, don't know, I just love seeing them, because it's just a funny oh, way. It's, it's Breaks it out. Those, those very overt fantastical elements are cute yeah it's also cool to see other students from i guess different classes because i i thought this was just ballet school but it's also an art school so that's cool mm -hmm. yes yeah oh god the, when tutu restores the power of heterosexuality to that one <laughs> <laughs> i fail to see the problem that this young woman is having she just wants to draw the pretty popular girl yeah Okay, show. Also, Sometimes you're really straight. I was also a little mad that we didn't get to see her after. Like she's just ugh, who now knows? Yeah. Back to painting like, fruits. And Arena, everyone kind of like, yeah, you're you're gone now. You're good. Your your role Actually is done. dead to me. <laughs> Solved it. <laughs> I will also note, note like Russell Meyer saying like, you know, a story doesn't need two heroines, does it? And I'm like, mm, I read too much of Yuri manga to. <laughs> <laughs> like again i adore this show and all the main characters are very shippable but there are certain moments where it is just uh, intensely heterosexual <laughs> like okay okay show <laughs> uh, yeah yeah I, I, like muto has has that kind of foreshadowing moment where he talks about you know the, the things i feel for for Rue and for Tutu and for you, Fakir, are all different. I'm like, okay, show. <laughs> sure they are. 
Uh, okay. Now I'm just being a nerd. Uh, uh, one thing that... I think there'll be plenty of time to talk about it next time, but I would um, encourage you to... Uh, the, like the openings, the the openings read by B. Arthur will continue to be important. Like uh, the way that they shifted towards not having endings so much as ending on questions and questioning the decisions of characters in the story and whether those are are happy or good decisions is a thing a, a thing that will continue to happen. Okay, <laughs> I like them so good. Yes, good. and if listeners, you are watching along at home. Next time we will be watching episodes 14 through 20. So that's seven more episodes. You can do it. I believe in you. And that wraps it up for this episode of the Princess Tutu Watch Along. If you liked what you heard, you can find more episodes of Chatty AF on SoundCloud by searching Chatty AF. And if you really liked what you heard, you could toss us a dollar on Patreon, which goes a long way towards creating NFM content on the page and in your earbuds. You can find us uh, on various websites. Uh, as mentioned, we are on patreon.com slash anime feminist, or you can find us on social media channels. We're on Facebook at anime femme. We're on Tumblr at anime feminist, and we are on Facebook at anime feminist. And our flagship website is www.animefeminist.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, remember, to those who defy their fate, glory. Glory.